بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد الحمد لله الله سبحانه وتعالى has blessed us to be able to start another book and uh, inshallah just a reminder for the good tidings for those who seek knowledge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says you know a, a command from him to learn and to understand and to seek فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَى اللَّهُ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِذَنْبِكْ Know there's nobody worthy of worship except Allah and seek forgiveness of your sins so all the scholars they say الْعِلْمُ قَبْلَ الْقَوْلِ وَالْعَمَلْ so knowledge precedes speech and action Right, and the Prophet ﷺ told us, "Man salaka tariqan yaltamisu fihi alman sahal Allahu bihi tariqan ila al-jannah." Whoever goes out on a path trying to seek knowledge, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will make a path to paradise easy for him. And the scholars used to give glad tidings to the students that come because it's a sign of tawfiq from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala that you are able to seek and study knowledge. That means that, inshallah, because Allah, you know, the Prophet said, "Man yudid Allahu bihi khairan yufaqihu fi al-din." Whoever Allah wants good for, He makes him knowledgeable in the religion. So the scholars say that those who are able to study and attend the lectures and you know, get knowledgeable in the deen, it's a sign for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love for them and wanting good for them. And the opposite is true that if those who are unable to attend lectures or unable to seek knowledge, it's a sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may be displeased with them and uh, turning away from them because they will be from the ignorant. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala those who are sincere in seeking knowledge and that's the most important thing that when we start you know our endeavor inshallah for for seeking knowledge that we protect our our niya and renew our niya make it khalis in the wajhillah you know to make it sincere for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and these are the important characteristics for any ibadah you know you have to have the purity of intention and the agreement with the sharia so talab al ilm is a form of worship it's one of the best forms of worship that you can do because you're learning how to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so in that worship you should make sure that your intentions are pure that you're doing it for his sake to lift the ignorance from ourselves to teach our families to teach the society at large it's a trust and it's a manna for us to increase your sincerity uh, the scholars recommend of course to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know asking Allah to make us sincere for his sake to read the Quran you know every time you read the Quran and you read the ayat of Jannah and Nar and see how that this dunya is fania there's nothing in it so we seek the reward of the akhirah that helps your, your, you to perfect your intention. You know, when you realize that if you're doing it for the sake of Allah, it will be everlasting and, and it will give you reward in the akhirah forever. Right? But if you do it for something in the dunya, it's going to be disappearing. So reading the Quran is another way to help you uh, get from the mukhlisin, those that are sincere in intention. Um, also, you know, taking into account that um, every action is by intention as the Prophet Sallallahu said, right? So renew your niyyah, concentrate your niyyah that you want to lift the ignorance from yourself so you can get closer to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Uh, with the knowledge we hope that we can be stern and steady in it. You know when you're seeking knowledge don't give up. Always continue, always strive. Just like when you have a high goal in the dunya, you work very hard for it. Try to be that way with knowledge because knowledge is a treasure that's greater than any treasure of the dunya. Right, just like people will struggle and strive and 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 lose sleep over uh, trying to make the extra dollar. Do that for the sake of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and seeking knowledge. Right, and remember the prophets alayhim salat was salam. They don't leave anything behind except knowledge. لا يرثو درهم ولا دينارا. Right, they don't leave uh, coin or dollar, but they leave knowledge. So whoever is taken from knowledge is taken from the inheritance of the prophets. So just the words of encouragement, inshallah, is to make us of those who are sincere and strive to seek this knowledge and to spread the knowledge to it's a manna upon you you know when you have been given a gift from Allah to learn something about the deen it's a trust from Allah subhanahu wa that you can inshallah teach it to others right so we live in a, a society full of darkness and we want to inshallah fill it with light and the only way you can do that is by getting knowledge so this book that we're going to start inshallah is the uh, Umdat al-Fiqh which is the foundation of fiqh and the Imam of uh, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal rahimahullah and it's written by the Imam uh, Al-Mujahid Shaykh Al-Islam uh, Wahid Al-Alam Muafiq al-Din Abu Muhammad Abdullahi ibn Ahmed ibn Muhammad ibn Qudama Mashhur or, or he was known as Al-Muafiq ibn, ibn Qudama one of the great scholars of the Hanabira um, he was actually him and his family you will find many books by them he's one of the greatest of the Imams of the past 
uh, and, and they are said to be descendants of Umar radiallahu anhu, the Sahabi al Jadid. So he was, you know, his great 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 grandfather would be Muhammad ibn Salib, uh, who was the son of Abdullahi, who was the son of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, jami'an. So this is a great sharaf that they are from the descendants of Umar from the Quraysh. Uh, he was born in a town called uh, Jama'il, which is Kare- close to Nablus, which is in uh, Palestine. And he's known, you know, as. Uh, Ibn Qudama al-Maqdisi also because from Bayt al-Quds, uh, Jerusalem. You know, so this is the usul of the Imam. Um, because of the war at the time they had to leave Palestine and they went to Sham, to Damascus and that's where he grew up uh, memorizing the Quran at a young age and being from a family of knowledge he sought knowledge at a young age. Wasirat uh, al-Muwafiq a'adham min an yuhatu biha fi muqaddamat kitab his seerah or his story is like a lot larger than we have the time to get into. There's written actually like volumes about his life, you know. I'll mention some of the statements of the ulama about him. But just to, to know, you know, we're not doing justice in that. I just want to give you a brief uh, biography or some of the statements of the ulama about this imam. So it's encouraging for us to seek, uh, to study his book. So for while he was t- kept busy with uh, seeking knowledge and, and writing knowledge, he wrote many, many books. We'll go through some of them, inshallah, when we finish this part. But his uh, students said that he used to uh, teach from Fajr until Dhuhr and then take a small break. And then his students would come back and he would read from Dhuhr, teach from Dhuhr till Asr. And then from Asr until Maghrib, right? Different subjects from, from, from throughout the day. And he would at the same time be writing books. Um, وكان مجالس عامرا دائما بالفقهاء والمحدثين وأهل الخير وكان في ما هذا وما موصلته التأليف يقرأ في كل يوم وليلة سبع سبع القرآن. and his his دروس his lessons were filled with the علماء الفقهاء المحدثين and طلاب العلم right and he would uh, with this still be writing books so he's teaching throughout the day and he's writing books and all with all that he would complete the Quran every seven days you know he'd read a seventh of the Quran daily. Along with these durus and along with qiyam al and along with teaching. And he used to always be, even with all his durus, he would be keen to pray the sunnah at his house. So he'd pray the fard in the masjid that he's an imam of, then he'd go home and pray sunnah, and then he'd come back and teach again. And he's written in many subjects, and he was an imam in, in fiqh, in hadith, in usul al fiqh, in, in tafsir al Quran, in faraid, in nahu. And he is one of the like mujtahideen of his Asr. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he just said, مَا دَخَلَ الشَّامِ بَعْدِ الْأَوْزَعِي أَفْقَهُ مِنْ شَيْخِ الْمُوَفِّقِ That nobody's entered Sham, the place of Syria and Palestine and Lebanon. One of the great, you know, all the, lot, many great scholars came to that area. He said, no one has entered Sham more knowledgeable than after Awza'i, who was from the, you know, great fuqaha of the past, of the Tabi'een, more knowledgeable than Imam al muwaffiq which is this Imam that we're studying his book. And Shams al-Din ibn al-Jawzi, rahimahullah, he described him, كان الموفق إماما في فنون ولم يكن في زمانه بعد أخي أبي عمر والعماد أزهد ولا أورع منه. He said that he was an imam in all the different sciences of, of the Islam. And there was no one more uh, pious except his you know, cousins, like co- comparable to him in Zuhd, and taqwa, like you know, being pious and close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa kana kathiru al-haya, and he was very shy. Uzufat uh, al-dunya, he was f- leaving the dunya, like he didn't care about the dunya, he abstained from the dunya. Hanyan and layyan and mutawadi'an, and muhabban al masakin. He was very like humble and easy going, and he was uh, very kind to the poor people. Husn al akhlaq, he had the best of character. Jawad and Sakhiyan, he was very generous. من رأه كان رأى بعض الصحابة وكأنه نور يخرج من وجهه. And when some people saw him, it was as if they were looking at the Sahaba. That's how pious he was. Like nur, light was coming from his face. وقال أيضا شهدت من الشيخ أبي عمر وأخيه الموفق ونسيبه العماد ما نرويه عن الصحابة والأولياء الأقذار. He's saying that, and I've seen from him and from his cousin, like I said, his cousin also was one of the great scholars of Islam, and his uh, nephew. I've seen from them, um, like the Sahaba and the Oliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said, like, 
looking at them alone, let me like forget my family and my country. You know, because when this Imam was going to seek knowledge with them, they looked so beautiful and they were so close to the life of the Sahaba, it made them forget everything else. And it goes on, there's so many different scholars narrating about them, um, how he was, you know, prayed the night prayer, how he was uh, very keen, even in argument, like uh, when people debated him, he would always smile. And they said that he would kill his opponent with smiling. Like he never got upset in argument. He would always be the best of character and he would argue and, and, and smile in the opponent's face. And when it got to Ilm al-Kalam, like, you know, um, kind of like theology or... or stuff more with like philosophy and theology he would not uh, answer or debate except with the Quran and Sunnah and if, it, if they delve deep into these different types of philosophies and theologies he would leave it alone he never delved into that he didn't have time for that but if it was you know something in the Quran or Sunnah he would make statements if it was something going beyond that he would just abstain from it because he didn't have time to waste on foolishness from his um, you know books that he's written Umdat al-Fiqh, which is the book we're studying here, and this is for the beginning student of knowledge in fiqh, right? The scholars of the past, up until this time, when they write the books, they, they try to do it at the levels, different levels for each um, type of student. So the first one, they want to start with a very basic text where you get a general understanding of the deen, all the types of uh, ibadat and mu'amalat, right? The types of worship and types of transactions that you have in Islam at one statement, you know, like th which is usually the qawl al-rajih of the madhab, like the strongest statement of the madhab. And then once you master that, you go on to like an uh, intermediary level, which he also wrote a book called uh, Al-Muqni' which is the second level, you know, for like intermediaries. And then he wrote Al-Kafi, which is a little bit harder than that. And then he wrote Al-Mughni. Al-Mughni is basically comparing all the different madhab. And it's uh, in 10 to 15 volumes, depending on which kind of print you have. And this Imam wrote all four of that, and they're all four considered like the, the basis for the madhab of Imam Ahmed, right? He has like some of the strongest opinions, and he's a uh, mu'tamid for madhab, which is like his statement is considered in the madhab above others. So he wrote these four books which are studied, you know, throughout the world in this, in this madhab. And then Mughni is, is studied by all the different madhab because it compares all the different madhab, and he does a tarjih in that. But in general, when you're seeking knowledge, you always start with a basic text, you master it, you go to the next level, the next level, and then inshallah you get to the level of comparing the different madahab. He also wrote um, a Rawdat al-Nadr, which is one of the greatest or, or one of the best books in usul al-fiqh, right? He did Mukhtasr uh, al hadith he did a sharh in the, an explanation of Ilal al-Hadith, which is a fine science of hadith. Al-Burhan fi Masa'ad al-Qur'an, a book about the tafsir of the Qur'an, the, the different issues of the Qur'an. Kitab uh, al the, the, the book of the repenters Kitab al-Qadr He wrote in the Aqidah of Qadr um, Fadail al-Sahaba uh, the, the benefits of the Sahaba The, the blessings of the Sahaba uh, Kitab al-Riqa wal-Buka wal The book about like softening your heart and crying uh, And he wrote, you know We don't have time to go through all of them But over 30 books That are very popular throughout the world And to this day you know, He was born in like around 500 uh, and until this day we study his books but this is the book inshallah we're studying uh, he was born 541 from the Hijri and he died 620 from the Hijri um, like we said it's not giving proper justice to give his seerah but if you go back and study about him you'll find uh, many uh, great scholars of Islam praising him and talking about his beautiful qualities and his scholarship and the book that we're studying here is a testimony to that you know the book says written that have lasted all this time, you know, almost a thousand years, that are studied throughout the world, is a sign and testimony to this, uh, the greatness of this Imam. May Allah have mercy upon him. Uh, the book, inshallah, will start today, just going to the, uh, the Muqaddimah, the introduction of the Imam himself, a uh, brief explanation, we probably won't finish it, we'll start just the first section. So, he starts with, Alhamdulillahi, Ahl alhamdi wa mustahaqihi. That he says, uh, praise to Allah. All praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you say Al, Al is istighraq, which means like all praise belongs to Allah. Lillahi, to Allah. And hamd is different from shukr in the sense that alhamd is praise or thana, you know, with your tongue about something, even if the person or the, you know, the, the entity, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, didn't do something for you, but for the jameel or the beautiful characteristic in that person. So, for example, our friend here is a fan of 
the Dallas Cowboys or something like that. And he, you know, the, what, what's the quarterback's name? Whatever the quarterback's name. He says, oh, he's such a great quarterback, right? Or he's like a great wide receiver. Or he's so fast, right? Even though that person didn't do nothing for you. You never met that person before. But you're giving him praise because of that good characteristic in that person. So Allah Azza wa he has the best of characteristics, the best of the attributes, the best of the names. So he, he, you give him hamd, praise for all the beautiful names and attributes and he deserves that praise, right? Even though, even if we, he has done nothing for us, but he has done everything for us. But that's what praise is, that's what hamd is. Shukr is with muqabal, which means that somebody has done something for you and you, you give him thanks, right? Man la yashkur nas la yashkur Allah. The Prophet Sallallahu said, whoever is thankful to the people is not thankful to Allah, right? And then uh, shukr can be with the tongue, it can be with the heart, and it can be with the actions. Like Allah Azza wa said, "Amanu ala Dawood shukra, do shukr, act upon shukr." Right. So those are the little the minor distinguish between alhamd and shukr, and it can go like in much more detail. But inshallah, we'll try to keep the sharh or the explanation uh, brief, so you just get a general understanding. So that's the difference between hamd and shukr. Alhamdulillahi, ahl alhamdi wa mustahqihi, ahl Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is ahl alhamd. He is b- um, befitting of Hamd. Hamd belongs to him. Praise belongs to him. You know, he is the greatest of all. He is Allahu Akbar. He deserves all Hamd with Thana. Hamdan yuftalu ala kulli Hamdan ka fadli lahi ala khalqihi. Praising uh, that goes above all praise as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above his creation. Right? Meaning giving Allah the most beautiful praises that we can give to him. وَأَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَى اللَّهُ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ شَهَادَةٌ قَائِمًا لِلَّهِ بِحَقِّهِ And I bear witness, there is nobody worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَحْدَهُ alone لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ He has no partner لَهُ شَهَادَةٌ قَائِمًا لِلَّهِ بِحَقِّهِ uh, uh, A witnessing that is uh, established for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his right, right? When you bear witness that there's nobody worthy of worship, you have ithbat and nafi. When you say la ilaha, that's nafi. You're negating every single thing that's worshipped besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Illallah is ithbat, meaning you affirm all worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To nobody else except Him. La sharika la. He deserves no, he, he needs no partner, He has no partner. Right? And this is uh, important when you make the shahada because affirmation is not sufficient in itself. The, the mushrikeen. It said, Allah said, وَلَا يُؤْنُ أَكْثَرُهُمْ إِلَّا وَهُمْ يُشْرِكُونَ Right? وَمَا نَعْبَلُمْ إِلَّا لِيُقَرْبُ اللَّهَ ظُلْفَ That not everybody worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like most people worship Allah except that they are mushrik with Him. They are committing shirk with Him. Right? Allah says that. And then the mushrikeen, they said, we don't, uh, we don't worship these like idols except that they can get us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So it's important in the shahada that you have La ilaha, which negates everything that's worshipped besides Allah, and then affirmation, Illallah, Allah is worshipped alone. And for the shahada, there are seven main requirements for it to be accepted. Right? We've ta- talked about it before. Al ilm, knowledge, which the opposite is jahl. Al ilm wal yaqinu, certainty, which is the opposite of doubt or rabe. Wal qubul, acceptance. Which is the absence of rejection. You accept everything in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, except the, de- the deen of Islam. You accept all of it, right? You don't reject it. Al inqiyad, you submit to it, you obey. The opposite is disobedience. Al ilm wal yaqeen wal qubul wal inqiyad, fadhil wa qul wa sidq, truthfulness. You, 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 you believe in it and its truthfulness, right? You're truthful to it. The opposite is kadib or nifaq, hypocrisy or lying. And then ikhlas, you're sincere for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You sincerely believe in it and Allah alone, worshipping Him alone. And the opposite is shirk. And then the last uh, pillar or the condition of shahada is muhabba, loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And the opposite is hating. You don't hate anything from the deen. As a Muslim, you can't hate anything from the deen. But you love and you hate for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You love what He loves and you hate what He hates. So those are the conditions of la ilaha illallah. Inshallah, if you have the time to go back and study, these are important aspects of aqidah that make your shahada correct. وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ غَيْرَ مُرْتَابٍ فِي صِدْقِهِ And I bear witness that Muhammad is his servant and his messenger without having any doubt in his truthfulness. Um, to believe in the messenger, messengership of, of the Prophet ﷺ, he has seven rights upon us as well. 
that we believe in him first and foremost, that he was a prophet and messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to the entire world, the Arab and the Ajim, the Arabs and those that are non-Arab, the white and the black, the poor and the rich, the whole world, he's the final messenger. So we believe in him. We obey him. Right? We have to obey him. Like, مَا أَتَاكُمْ رَسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُ That which the Prophet ﷺ has given you, you will follow it, take it. And that which he has told you to abstain from, you, you abstain from it. Um, we emulate his example, following his sunnah. That's from his rights upon us. That's number three. Number four, we love him. Right? The Prophet ﷺ says, None of you truly believes until I am more beloved to, you, to him or her than his own family. Uh, we have respect and honor and reverence for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Number six, that we believe he is the final messenger, the final prophet. There's no prophet after him. There's no revelation after the Quran. And number seven, that we send the Salat was Salam Alayh from his rights. So these are the seven rights of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I also encourage you to go back and study that because it's an important part of our Aqidah. Uh, Muhammad, his name, it comes from the word to praise. Right, and both you know he has many many names. We won't go through all of them, but to mention the ones that related to the Hamd is Muhammad and Ahmed. Muhammad ala mufa'al. It means that he um, is being continuously praised, like that's the the qual the quantity, the number of praise. And you can imagine he's been praised how many times a day that we pray upon the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right? Every single place around the world has some type of Muslims that are praying upon the Prophet sending salatu wasalam ala nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam in the khutb in the dars right now we're talking about sallallahu alayhi wasallam every salat that you do tahiyatu lillahi wa salawatu wa salam right on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam so he is the most praised human being in all of human history and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen him to be the final messenger so his name Muhammad means to be praised often Right? And Ahmed means to be praised in the best of manner. That's why he has the Maqam Mahmud, the highest place in Jannah. Right? So that's the qual quality of the praise. He's praised in the best of manners. Right? And these are both his names, Muhammad and Ahmed. And he has other names, inshallah, you can go back and study. But that's what Muhammad. Abduhu, his servant. This is to distinguish uh, from some religions that take their prophets as gods or sons of gods or raise them up above levels that they should be raised. So Allah has called him Abdu, which is one of the, you know, the only one that you be a slave to and it's honor for you is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's an honor. At the same time, it's reminding us that the Prophet Wasallam is a servant of Allah. He's not the creator. He's not to be elevated above his status. Like the Prophet Wasallam warned us not to elevate him as the Christians elevated Isa alayhi salam. Right? So that's why the, the scholars, they always say, and Allah azza wa jal in the Quran, Abduhu, right? Alhamdulillah, الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب سبحان الذي أسرى بعبده ليلا من مسجد الحرام إلى مسجد الأقصى. Right, Abd. He called Allah subhanahu wa taala calls the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم Abd. And then رسوله رسوله that's تشريف honor. He's the messenger of Allah. He gets wahi from Allah. Not every man has this this honor and this 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 blessing, right? So this is that the, the, the scholar, the Imam is saying about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Abduhu Rasuluhu غَيْرُ مُرْتَابٍ fi sidqihi. There's no doubt in his truthfulness, right? He was called Sadiq Al-Ameen even before he received the Wahi. His own family, his own tribe, everybody called him Sadiq Al-Ameen, the truthful one. So even after that we don't have any doubt in his authenticity, in his truthfulness to us. Abu Bakr anhu is called a Siddiq. Why? Because he believes in the Prophet without any doubt. All those that were close to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you study the seerah, as soon as he told him he was a Prophet, they believed without even questioning him. You know, the closest ones to him, Khadija, Ali, uh, Zaid, his daughters, Abu Bakr, uh, all this, the close Sahaba, they, they became Muslim instantly without even questioning him. Are you sure? Did you really receive revelation? Are you sure you're not dreaming? No, they, they accepted it instantly because of his Siddiq, right? They knew him to be Sadiq al Amin. So this is uh, why he said, غَيْرُ murtab fi sidqihi." There's no doubt in his Sidq. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. O sallallahu wa sallam alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi. And uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send his praise. Right? Salat from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is his rahmah or barakah. And the salat from the angels 
and from the believers is dua that we make dua for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi upon his family and those are all that are related to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi um, some scholars say if you say Alihi by itself without Sahaba it means his family and his companions but here he said Wa Alihi wa Sahbihi so upon his family and upon his companions right a Sahbihi Sahaba is one that's mulazim to somebody else that's somebody that you're close to that you stay with right that's what Sahaba means those are the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the, the the definition of sahabi or sahaba is uh man laqiya rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mu'minun bihi wa mata ala dhalika that whoever met the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam believing in him and he died upon it right so for a sahabi to be considered sahabi he had to meet the prophet he had to be a believer at the time and he had to die upon iman right so if you didn't meet the sah- the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam you can't be considered a sahabi if a person left Islam and died without uh, left Islam at the time, he can't be considered a Sahabi, right? And if he died upon other than Islam, he's not a Sahabi. So the Sahaba, they're all Udul, they're adil, they're they're just people, and they're the ones that met the Prophet. When he says Laqiya, it means to meet because that is a little bit more appropriate than to see, because you'll see some definition says whoever saw the Prophet Sallallahu and believed in him and died upon that is a Sahabi. Why do you think meeting is more appropriate? Huh? That's a good one, mashallah. If they were blind, right? I wasn't thinking about that, but that's a d- that's a good point, mashallah. What else? Can you see the, the Prophet in the dream? Yes, from the Aqid of Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah, you can see the Prophet in the dream. You know, for those that are righteous, for those that are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that love the Prophet, sometimes it's for blessing from Allah that he can be seen in the dream. And the Prophet told us that the shaitan cannot imitate him. So if a person sees a Prophet with his uh, characteristics and everything as described in the books that we have, he is the Prophet ﷺ, right? So then, if we said to see, then they can say, okay, I saw the Prophet in the dream, so I'm a Sahabi, right? It's not correct. <laughs> so you have to say to meet, laqiya, that's a stronger definition. Whoever met the Prophet ﷺ in his life, obviously, then he is considered Sahabi. But there is... Um, one way we can be a Sahabi. I've told. I didn't s- understand that. Um. Okay then. <laughs> 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 Crazy phones. So, wha- which way can we be a Sahabi? What do you think? Emulating a Sunnah. Mm. Huh? Uh. It's yeah. it's possible, maybe not likely, but it's possible. No. In the akhirah? In the akhirah, yeah, but this life I was talking about. I hope, inshallah, we can meet the Prophet. Mm-hmm. Can we have a hint? Mm. If I give you the hint. Go away. I give you the way. Okay. Do you want to see the statement? <laughs> okay, it, it, it won't be with the Prophet Muhammad. Allah, right? mm. It won't be with Not with the Prophet Muhammad. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In this dunya, inshallah, in the akhirah, we can meet the Prophet. Does it involve Isnad? Change of, uh, mm. okay. like, like you mentioned the Quran. If you, if there is like to the Prophet No, not that. That's good, mashallah. But no. Uh, okay, towards the end of time, who's supposed to come back? Huh? Asa. So if you meet Asa, you can be a Sahabi. Yeah, but it's a time of great fitness, so. If we believers and we follow Isa alayhi salam, that would be beautiful inshallah to be like a sahabi if he comes back in our lifetime. But that's the only possibility. It's just a uh, trivia question that I ask the high schoolers sometimes. So, alhamdulillah. But technically, other than that, la, because the Prophet alayhi salam, has passed away, inshallah, in the akhirah, we can meet the Prophet. Um, the number of sahaba roughly are uh, over 100,000. Right, that's over a hundred thousand that made Hajj with him, and of course there were some Sahaba that passed away before that Hajj, that final Hajj with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. From those Sahaba, we know a couple of thousand by name, you know, and from those couple of thousand, there's like a couple of hundred that have, you know, more stories about them, and from those couple of hundred, you know, there's less than a hundred maybe that are 
very popular and have lots of uh, statements about them, right? And it shows that, you know, like the, the quality of those that are closest to the Prophet how they had a lot higher uh, fadl and blessing. Um, the purpose, also one of the reasons the scholars, they mention the Sahaba often in the, the books, even of fiqh and, and other, um, you know, subjects, is to show the aqeed of Ahl sunnah wal jama'ah because you'll find certain groups or certain um, peoples that actually curse the Prophet, the, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum or they s they say that they're not Muslims a'udhu billah min dalik right so the, uh, the the scholars they always mention to, to make sure that the belief of Ahl sunnah wal jama'ah is that we respect the Sahaba they were the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and they were giving many of them were giving the glad tidings of Jannah and how could you insult or curse or say bad things about those that are closest to the Prophet Sallallahu right? What kind of religion is that? So that's one of the reasons the, the scholars, they mention, you know, the Sahaba, they're keen to mention it because they deserve to be, you know, thanked for the work that they did and they sent down the knowledge to us and also to make a point that we distinguish us from the other groups that we respect and we love the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum. And then he says, مَا جَاءَ سِحَابُ بِوَدْقِهِ وَمَا رَعَدُ بَعْدَ Barqihi. So uh, may the Allah bless and send his, pro his peace and blessing upon the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his family and the Sahaba as long as the, the, the clouds shall bring rain and as long as the thunder shall follow the lightning, right? And this is just a kind of a poetic way to, to say that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continuously send his peace and blessings upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his family his offspring and the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, right? And Ra'd, the thunder, you know, Sihab, the clouds, Witq is a form of rain. We said in some narrations there's actually angels that bring down every single raindrop and put it the spot that it's supposed to be. You know, there's angels in charge of that. And also the Ra'd is supposed to be, in some narrations, it's the sound of one of the angels uh, making, you know, praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You said, Ra'du bihamdihi wal malaikatum khifa. The, the, the angels they praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so when you hear that sound say the tasbih say subhanallah say alhamdulillah in the rain the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said he used to put it on his body and say this is kind of qariba ahd bi rabbi that it was close it, was, it just came from the sky like meaning it was closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he seeks the, the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when it comes down and just to be remindful of Allah and thankful to, to Allah and this is just the um, the quarter of the introduction inshallah I just wanted to give you um, that part tonight and if you want to have any questions, to, uh, next week we'll finish the introduction and start the, the book, inshallah. So if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free now. And then if not next week, we'll start. Uh, basically what your question is, if, if I can summarize it, is should you study directly from the Quran or Sunnah, like the fiqh? What we're, now, we're studying now is fiqh, the fiqh of worship, inshallah, and the fiqh of mu'amalat, right? Can we go directly to the Quran and Sunnah? And uh, take from that and learn from that, or should we study a madhab, right? If you are a mujtahid, you reach the level of ishtihad, then by all means go directly to the Quran and the Sunnah and the Hadith and drive the fiqh and, and, and follow that. You have that level. You've mastered uh, the Arabic language. You m you memorize the ahkam, ahadith al ahkam, the ayat of ahkam. You know, you know all the fiqh and usul al fiqh and everything like that. You know, you studied 20, 30, 40, 50 years of your life. Then go, yes, by all means. But if you are a beginning student of knowledge, then no, because you don't have the tools of ishtihad. A person can actually um, go and make rulings that are contradictory because they don't know that a hadith has been abrogated, right? Or they don't know like an ayat has been abrogated, for example, right? Or this hadith explains this ayat, or this ayat. They haven't mastered the ulum to go on them their, their own, you know, so they make faulty. Uh, statement. That's what scholars are for, right? And these madhab is basically to make it easy. Like most of them, all of them, I can say, inshallah, they are built upon the Quran and Sunnah. It's to make it easier for a student of knowledge to understand it. Like this Imam, when we're going to this book, he's taken, you know, basically, you can imagine, fifteen volumes of 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 work of ayat and ahadith and fiqh and aqwal ulama and put it down into like a small book. Like the original book of this is like about this small, the metan itself, right? Just one statement, so you can remember. Like for example, you know the hadith of wudu is very clear, right? But which, what's fard of the wudu and what's sunnah of the wudu, right? Most people that are thinking that they can follow the Quran and sunnah directly without studying fiqh the correct way, 
they won't know which is fard and which is sunnah. They know how to do it correctly, but say you're in a situation where there's not enough water and you can only use it, do the fard part of the wudu. What is fard for wudu? Right? What are the arkan? Right? What are the sunnah? If you're in salat and you miss something, how do you know if you should do sujood or sahu or you have to do the whole rakah over again? Right? That's the arkan and the, and the sunnah. So these things are derived, the scholars, they've worked their whole lives to drive it and make it easy for us to understand. Right? They did the job for us. You know, so we can go and read the books and have that understanding of the hadith and the ayat so we can worship Allah better. That's the purpose of studying fiqh. Right? And the other thing is, um, you'll get a different type of knowledge and, and malaka or an ability to, to learn and to drive rulings from when you study a madhab. You know, if you study the hadith directly, you won't get all that. You'll get the explanation of the hadith, which is, of course, a great blessing and everybody should do that as well. But it's a different way. You know, so the scholars encourage you to, to study at least the fiqh of ibadah, so you know how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala correctly, upon any madhab that's, you know, conducive to, from the madhab of Ahl sunnah wal jama'ah, let me straight that out, you know, and then um, from there, you can expand upon it, right? Once you've, you know, mastered the basics, then you can get into more level, then you get to more level, and inshallah, you can reach the level of ishtihad and, and, and get to like, you know, picking what's right and wrong, but until then, you should study, you know, the basic text, at consult the scholars to teach you, because like they said, you know, من كان شيخه كتابه كان أخطأه أكثر من سوابه. Whoever is sheikh is the book, his mistakes will be more than his correct actions because he can be misguided and not understand. That's what the scholars are for. The sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ was to teach the sahaba who taught the tabi'een, who taught the tabi tabi'een. We have a tradition of scholarship in our religion and taking the knowledge from the, the scholars that explain to us the books. But you'll find, you know, sometimes um, the person will like criticize certain madhahib and then when you go and study it they have very strong proofs for it right the reason like I recommend doing one madhahib you know whatever it may be like convenient to your country or to your you know place of worship or whatever that the people follow around you so you can know is because if you study all of them it, it get, can get a little bit kind of confusing right so the basics is to, s to pick one and master it and understand it and then you can expand to the differences right so just in general, until you learn, you're following it, right? If the scholar says this is incorrect because, and he brings you the proof and stuff like that, alhamdulillah, you have a teacher that can show you, right? Which is great. You know, but in the meantime, if you don't have access, or whatever you have access to, you, you try to just master to understand better, right? So you don't get too much in the differences. Um, in general, like, the Hanafi sometimes differs a little bit more than the other three. Uh, like, you know, but they all have their adillah and they all have, like, very great scholarship and people that have written, you know, Masters of a hadith in all the madhahab. So it's not something like, you know, sometimes when we, we don't study well, we, we see that, like, how could that imam say such a thing? You know, but if you go and study it and see all the, the ayat and, and the hadith and the qawl of sahaba and stuff like that, they're not saying it from their own, like, ishti, you know, from their own desires, basically. They have proofs for it, you know. Even, like, for example, you know, in the Shafi'i madhahab, it, it breaks your wudu if you touch the opposite sex with lust or without lust, you know. A relative or non-relative in some of the uh, aqwal of the madhab, right? And if you read that, like you're like, you know, that's clear. It's not. That's not right. All the other madhab say it doesn't. It's only if you do it with lust, right? So why? But if you go back and study, they have some, you know, very strong evidences. I would say, you know, following the other madhab, it's not as strong as the other madhab, but still, like, I was surprised to see some of the the, the, the proofs that they have. So alhamdulillah, like all the imams of Ahl Sunnah and Jamaat, they they have strong scholarship and they have a strong foundation from the Quran and the Sunnah. Right, it's not just from their desires. Like the Maliki Madhab, you'll find certain things that you might say, "Oh, this contradicts this hadith." But he, he's basing his statement upon the ten thousand Sahaba and their offspring, right, that lived in Medina, that lived with the Prophet Sallallahu that followed their ways. So he has a strong hujjah. Like Ibn Taymiyyah said, that his proofs is, is considered a a hujjah, right? So it's just uh, respecting the scholarship of the Imma that that preceded us and a way to, you know, they made it easy for us to learn our deen. So just following this manhaj that had been followed for centuries, you know, or m over a thousand years now, uh, just to make it easier for us. Like, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You know, like if you want to spend your whole life, even if, like now, a lot of people won't be able to reach the level that they've reached because they were so close to the, the Prophet's time and the Sahaba's time and the language and the, the scholarship and, th and the lack of distractions, you know, they were, that's why we're studying their books. Subhanakallah, bihamdika, ashinu la ilaha illa, and astafkullah tubi, like.
جزاكم الله خيرا السلام عليكم ورحمه الله